Hey guys, it's Zoe from Ignite. Before we start with today's video, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and turn on the bell for post notifications if you enjoy this content. Today, we're gonna to be talking about Act One from Waiting for Godot. Hope you enjoy this resource. So Waiting for Godot begins with a fairly bleak setting. The first stage directions are a tree, a country road evening, which kind of sets a pretty, I suppose, post-apocalyptic setting for the play. <clears throat> so it begins with our two main characters, Vladimir and Estragon, and they're both engaging in pretty mundane situations. So Estragon is trying to take off his boot and he keeps engaging in this sort of monotonous, futile kind of action and Vladimir is kind of staring into his hat. So I suppose the first opening scene kind of establishes this whole idea of looking for meaning and having this sort of purposeless sort of continuous cycle of actions which have no inherent purpose and kind of paint a picture of a very bleak futile existence. <clears throat> So the characters begin in dialogue surrounding sort of themes from philosophy, religion, and kind of questioning the grand narratives that I suppose govern the time of the 1950s, post the Cold War era. And they kind of introduce this idea of Godot, this character that we are never as an audience privy to, we never meet Godot, but their overall goal appears to be waiting for Godot. So they kind of engage in dialogue um, repeating the same kind of idea of waiting for Godot and it's kind of unclear about what Godot arriving will signify for the characters but it seems like he is sort of defining their purpose for existence and is kind of a means to I suppose gain meaning in a meaningless context. <clears throat> So the characters then are introduced to Pozzo and Lucky. So Pozzo and Lucky have this sort of relationship of power and oppression. So Pozzo emerges as this kind of powerful figure who has Lucky as a slave. So it kind of criticizes the power dynamics that are seen in the post-Cold War era and shows Beckett kind of experimenting with the immorality of power and the relationships of class struggle which are formed in our contemporary context. So throughout this sort of interaction, you see Pozzo kind of aggressively um, sort of berating Lucky both verbally and physically, and then um, Lucky kind of appearing as this kind of cowering figure, which you never really um, sort of get a solid grasp of. <clears throat> there is one moment where Lucky engages in a sort of nonsensical monologue where um, using neolo neologisms like qua 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 or divine ap apathia, divine aphasia, kind of um, distorting what we understand as academic language and um, yeah, criticizing the meaning of language in this kind of futile world where nothing seems to make sense, there doesn't seem to be any purpose for anything. So it's kind of an interesting example of Beckett experimenting with language to sort of describe this futile existence that we're living in. So then the scene ends, or well, the act ends, with a boy coming and delivering a message to both Vladimir and Estragon, saying that whilst Godot won't be coming today, he'll definitely be coming tomorrow. It's not completely um, clear as to whether the boy has come before or not, but you kind of get the sense that this waiting for Godot has no end and that Godot may never come, and the characters are both sort of hopeful of this sort of premise which may not ever eventuate. <clears throat> and then the act finishes with Vladimir and Estragon saying, let's go. And then this um, last stage direction is they do not move. So kind of, I suppose, finishing with a phrase, with a musing on whether, um, despite the idea that their life is purposeless and there's no meaning and there's no inherent way out, I suppose, of the life that they're living, that they'll continue to wait regardless. <clears throat> so we're going to go through some key scenes now. So some of the major things that come up in Act 1 regard the sort of nonsensical, meaningless dialogue that Vladimir and Estragon engage in, and that actually makes up quite a large part of the act. So some of the quotes on the screen kind of encapsulate the tension between stage directions and speech, which is seen 
in the play and also um, the sort of black humour and satire which is used to both mask, I suppose, the inherently bleak aspect of the play of the idea that life is meaningless and also kind of in turn encourages us as responders through laughing to kind of understand that yes, this life is futile, there's nothing really here to see, I suppose. So the whole idea of Estragon with the stage direction given up again and then nothing to be done kind of encapsulates that idea of having no purpose or direction as inherently cyclical and this whole idea of what about hanging ourselves hmm it would give us an erection kind of says that you know whilst you can make, make light of these sorts of situations inherently you know life has this sort of bleak sort of meaningless as I've said um, existence. <clears throat> So um, another key th dynamic, as I mentioned earlier, was the dynamic between Pozzo and Lucky of master and slave. So Pozzo kind of emerges as this tyrannical figure of like capitalism and other power structures which were in place during World War II and again in the Cold War. Um, it shows, I guess, Beckett experimenting with the egotistical nature of power and the idea that power is inherently immoral and kind of questions and asserts Pozzo as a figure that whilst the characters aren't necessarily um, able to be identified or distinguished, Pozzo is kind of distant from the other characters in the sense that he has a more academic register and his dialogue is kind of a bit hypocritical and he obviously emerges as a figure of cruelty. And then there's Lucky who has the role of the slave in this relationship, symbolising the idea of power relationships where the oppressed are silenced in history and aren't allowed their own voice, which makes Lucky's monologue halfway through the, the act even more significant. So these are some of the excerpts from Lucky's speech. So um, it looks at the decline of language and the idea that you can kind of recognize like apathy kind of derives from apathy but the other words not as much but they do have precedent in sort of philosophical content um, if you look into that and um, kind of questions yeah the decline of um, academic thought and what this signals in the post-nuclear age <clears throat> and then at the end obviously we're introduced to the closing lines well shall we go yes let's go and then the stage directions end the act with they do not move. So I guess this kind of looks at the tension between stasis and change that we see throughout the text and kind of questions that, yes, whilst, um, you know, life appears to be not worth living and it's probably better to go and leave, we as humans, through looking at Estragon and Vladimir, continue to sort of remain and withstand this oppression and this purposelessness um, and I guess shows us hoping for a sort of form of salvation or acquiring a purpose, which is a really interesting way to look at life in the post-nuclear age. So that's it for Act 1. Hope you enjoyed this video. Once again, make sure to subscribe to this channel and turn on the bell for post notifications. I'll see you in the next video. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. If you do like the content, subscribe to our channel and we'll have more videos coming your way. That's right guys, thanks for watching and please make sure you check out our online resource database. We've had a team of state rank achievers and heads of English put these together for you, covering everything from essay structures and examples all the way through to craft of writing and comprehension skills. So check them out at ignitehse.com.au and we look forward to seeing you in the next video.